Austin to finish the game on a 17-2 run to beat Toronto tonight, 117-108, and end the Raptors' five-game win streak. Kyrie Irving had 27 and a career-high 18 assists and made some, uh, made some news after the game as well when he tried to explain his mindset for the criticism or complaint about shot selection at the end of the Orlando game, what he was saying about some of his young teammates as well, and the fact that he had to call LeBron James to discuss it all. Here's what he said after the game. I had to uh, call LeBron, you know, and tell him, like, you know, I apologize for <laughs> being that young player that wanted to everything at his, you know, at his fingertips, and I wanted everything to uh, be at, you know, my threshold. I wanted to be the guy that led us to the championship. I wanted to be the leader. I wanted to be all that, and, you know, the responsibility of being the best player in the world and leading a team is something that's not meant for many people. And Brown was one of those guys that came to Cleveland and tried to really show us, show us what it's like to win a championship. And it was hard for him. And uh, sometimes getting the most out of the group, it's not the easy, easiest thing in the world. And um, like I said, only few are, are meant for it or chosen for it. And, you know, I feel like the best person to call was him because, you know, he's been in the situation. You know, he's, he's been there with me where I've been the young guy of, you know, being a 22-year-old kid. and. You know, wanting everything. You want everything right now. You know, coming off an of all-star year starting, and then, you know, this, this heck of a presence comes back, and now i got to adjust my game to this guy. And, um, you know, you take it personal, but at the end of the day, he just wants what's best, and he has a legacy he wants to leave, and he has a window he wants to capture. So I think what that brought me back to is like, all right, how do I get the best out of this group of the success they had last year? And then helping them realize what it takes to win a championship. Hmm. Interesting perspective from Kyrie Irving. What do you what do you guys uh, make of what he said and the fact that he felt like he needed to call LeBron James to talk it over? It's I don't mind him calling LeBron James and talking it over. I'm not sure if this needed to be said to the media or played out in front of the media because only because of how it could look to certain people in the locker room. It could look like a passive aggressive shot to some of the younger guys. I'm not sure if that was the intent, but I know it could be looked at that way and it could be interpreted that way that now Kyrie is LeBron and the guys on Boston are the young guys that don't want to listen. And you just don't want to get caught up in that. And I'm sure it was probably unintentional by Kyrie. He probably just really, uh, the moment came full circle, that he is now where LeBron used to be and he understands all the teachings that he was trying to learn in Cleveland. But I just, it, it's one of those, it can come off weird and some guys in the locker room could interpret it differently. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, look, you can call LeBron James. You play with him. You shared a great moment, uh, great moments with him in Cleveland. But to talk about that, I mean, you, you, you sort of trying to read between the lines there and, mm -hmm. and interpret what he's trying to say. And he's, you know, kind of saying that the young guys are in the same position that maybe he was in, where he was frustrated and wanted to do more. Right, right. And, you know, you just keep that to yourself. Obviously, I think if the intention is to try to help lead and get these players to the promised land, to try to do what you did, what LeBron did for you and your team, try to do the same for the Celtics there. But I don't know, I just, like, I think the world of Kyrie, the brotherhood is, is strong, but what, I don't know. What, what brotherhood? You guess right. You guys don't have a brotherhood, but uh, the brotherhood at, at, at Duke. How dare you? Is uh, is strong. <laughs> and how dare you? But no, I mean, I, I just I, I don't know. I, I don't know how. I agree with you. I don't I don't know if I would say that. I don't know how that's interpreted. I don't yeah. know how I would feel as a teammate, young or old, having him sort of indirectly make those comments and maybe potentially throwing me under the bus. It's interesting, and it strikes me that it's maybe not a big deal if they've already had this conversation in the locker room with these young guys and maybe he said look I was I was you right I, I was you a few years ago but there's certain things Matt that that it go on in the locker room that stay in the locker room keep understood, in, understood. And, and, and keep it in house yes exactly and sometimes things will get out leaks things sure. are, but not an interview <laughs> you're on TV and so but we don't know what happened and you know we don't know what was said and what was discussed. Right. But I, I just would prefer you keep that in-house. I also felt like it was a little bit of a self-reflection for him. And, and again, maybe he doesn't need to see this, say this publicly, but what you said, it's kind of come full circle. And he realizes, oh, I was sort of a pain in the butt back when I was playing with LeBron and because I had a different perspective back then. Yeah, but I know, it was sort of introspective to me. Yeah, and you also have to realize at that point he didn't really like when LeBron went out there and made comments in the media as well because right, right. whenever you say comments like the young guys, it divides the team. It makes it seem like it's the young guys versus the old guys. And when you really look at the film, it's going to tell you that everybody's messing up. Young guys, old guys, guys in the middle – 
everybody's going to have times where they don't do the right job or they take a shot that's maybe out of character for them or, or maybe they could have made one more pass. So uh, you just have to watch how you phrase things because you never want something to come off as divisive. You all, it, it, when you're a young team and you're trying to figure it out to go be a championship contender, you're trying to get everybody on the same page. Anything that's not about that, you need to just throw it out as white noise. And, Matt, I just want to apologize. In my second year, I was difficult here on the set. <laughs> You were a pain. Uh, I, I want to apologize. You were, you were a huge pain for being difficult. <laughs> I'm not apologizing. I'm not apologizing for nothing. And I, and I know I was difficult. <laughs> I've been difficult everywhere I've been. <laughs> uh, by the way, while we were having this discussion, Steph Curry had a 20-point quarter. Wow. That game is now tied. Pelicans led by ended Toronto's uh, five-game win streak. And I believe I don't have the standings in front of me. I believe that knocked Toronto out of the best record in the in the league. Right? Milwaukee won tonight. Something like it. I'll double check this. Yeah, yeah. Milwaukee is, uh, yeah, Milwaukee's 32 and 12. Milwaukee's number one. 117, 108. Thank you very much. There's your final, and here's Kyrie Irving. Not that Kyrie necessarily had to say something about who should be closing games in Boston, but uh, there's no better evidence than what we just saw. Yeah, and no, we, when we talked about it there, I mean, you know, probably one of the best closers, you know, won games, playoff games, championship, game sevens. Uh, you know, and, and, and they needed that. I mean, the three bad losses they had on the road at Orlando, at Miami, Brooklyn as well. So to get back home against a great team, Kyrie Irving came out, played great. Of course, Toronto, give them credit. They fought back in the game, made it a close game, but Irving down the stretch is just too good. Yeah, Irving down the stretch is incredible, and I liked, I liked how he bounced back from the adversity that he had been through. They're obviously in the Orlando game. He wasn't happy with the way the game ended. He didn't get the ball, felt that he should have gotten the ball made some comments that his teammates didn't like. He later reeled it back in. But instead of harping on it, he, went, he made his apology, went past it. And this game, he proved why he needs to be the guy that gets the ball at the end of the game. And so it's more about showing than talking about, talking about it with your mouth. He showed why he should be the closer, hitting big shot after big shot. And I think that's something that these young guys on this team can respect because you can talk about it, but these young guys last year, they were a game away from the NBA Finals, so all the lip service doesn't matter. They want to see it. Right. And tonight, Kyrie showed it. Uncle Drew was in the building, <laughs> and I mean, <laughs> and he was saying Uncle Drew needs the ball in the clutch. Uh, his clutch resume is pretty good, as you, as you made mention Sometimes of. Sometimes people forget, so you got to, hey, just, just when they forget, you got to remind yeah, them who you really you're are. From, you're from Missouri, right? Yes. Show me, Stan. You got to show me. Yeah, you got to show me. Especially younger people. It's <laughs> absolutely true. So 2-1, Boston leads the season series now. What do you feel like you know about these two teams? Were they to hook up in a playoff series? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> Absolutely not. Because, because Boston has been so inconsistent all year long. They have these big wins, and then they will baffle you, and they'll get blown out by somebody that they shouldn't be blown out by. So I'm waiting to see for Boston to show me some consistency. I know they have the best talent in the Eastern Conference. I'm waiting for that talent to come together consistently like it did tonight. Yeah, I mean, Brendan said it best. I mean, we see this performance tonight by Boston, but then they're the type of team that, you know, next time could be blown out by 25. And so they have to figure it out. I think we all knew it would take some time mm -hmm. as you reinsert you know, uh, Kyrie Irving from last year, Hayward coming off the injury, uh, guys who had great roles last year and came out of, you know, Tatum and Brown. Uh, but we thought it'd be figured out by now. And it's a little bit alarming. Uh, great win tonight, but they didn't look great the last three games. Right. They can put together maybe the second half of the season just to run a game a week or two, or excuse me, two or three weeks where they get hot and they start playing the basketball we all anticipated. You know, then you might start saying, okay, this is the Boston team. But until then... You know, I'd probably go more with Toronto just because yeah. I know what I'm going to get from right. Toronto. The consistency of what they've shown throughout the season will carry over to the playoffs. E even within this game in the fourth quarter when Toronto was going on, a, I think it was a 9-0 or 10-0 run to get back into the game and retake the lead, Boston had some terrible possessions before Kyrie kind of took over the game. That's the difference between these two teams. The consistency that Toronto has, the role definition. Though You rarely see guys get out of character for the Toronto Raptors. Everybody knows their role. We played through Kyle Lowry, we played through Kawhi, and I get my shots off of them, and that's why everything moves smoothly. When you watch Boston, those Boston players sometimes hold the ball just a second too much. And that one second, that's the difference between getting a good shot and a great shot because they're all looking and trying to figure out when is it my turn to get mine? And that can, be, that can be a problem at times when you don't have those roles clearly defined. No, I mean, you said it best. I mean, you look at Boston, and obviously Kyrie Irving is, is who he is. He's the best player on the team. But, you know, Tatum was the go-to guy. 
last year in the playoffs. And then, mm -hmm. and then you have, you know, Terry Rozier who has a chip on his shoulder and feels like he should be getting his numbers. Hayward is a guy who's been accustomed to being that guy. So you have a lot of guys who, who are accustomed to being the alpha male and now are having to figure out how to adjust and adapt and fit in. And, and it's not working right now. Whereas, you know, it, it's not working consistently. Right. But in Toronto, it's clearly defined. Sure. And, uh, and so it, it, it's, that's why they've been able to play at a high level, you know, pretty consistent throughout the year. Good one tonight in Boston, and the Celtics beat Toronto 117 to 108. Checking in on the Pelicans. Uh, you know, he came out, his knee was a little sore, and uh, he was getting toward his minutes, so we thought it would be cautious to just not push him anymore. We thought we could finish the game off anyway, and it's just, you know, I hope it's nothing more than just soreness, just general soreness. Well, it's a knee, so it's, it's, all, it's all connected. So, anyway, he had a good good run, and that's what we wanted. Well, I mean, you know, to be honest with you, they hit five big threes that we were on them. They just they made some unbelievable shots. I thought when we got up 13, we got a little complacent, and uh, they scored too quickly, too fast, and and. Uh, you know, that was regrettable, but, uh, uh, at that, you know, we're up seven with about 40 seconds, and it's one, two, three, I think three threes, they were hit, they were covered, and they hit them, and, you know, they tip your hat to them, and, hey, let's go to the next one. What were your thoughts on that last, on the last play, like, you that last shot? Really yeah, he's, he's a guy who can get a wide open shot like that, and um, uh, he can hit them, and, yeah, that's why we went there. Well, the first time. Well, Mike D'Antoni got to be scratching his head talking about Eric Gordon leaving the game with that same right knee injury that had cost him eight games. Story of the night, James Harden goes off in the third quarter for 22, finishes the night with 58 points, back-to-back 50-point -back efforts, but not enough tonight as the Nets get a spectacular effort from Jared Allen, taking advantage of not only the shorthanded, but the short rockets. Jared Allen joins a very elite and very small club Players in NBA history to score 20 points and grab 24 rebounds prior to turning 21 years old. Allen joins Andre Drummond, Dwight Howard, Shaquille O'Neal, and John Drew from back on Sekou's favorite Hawks team back in 74-75. <laughs> Jared Allen tonight with an amazing game, 20 points, 24 rebounds, taking advantage of P.J. Tucker, who had to guard him a large portion of the night. Meanwhile, inside of our coach's film room tonight, giving us a unique perspective of the action is Derek Fisher. D Fish, in addition to Jared Allen inside, Spencer Dinwiddie outside, 33 points, 10 rebounds, including some incredible clutch buckets in the fourth quarter in overtime. Yeah, Spencer Dinwiddie, even though James Harden, the man in Houston, that's who everybody wants to talk about. But as we roll the clips here, we'll see Spencer Dinwiddie's ability to make plays at multiple levels. Hill down three, Austin Rivers trying not to foul, giving him some room, pulls up from four or five feet behind the three-point line, knocks it down. And here, really impressive execution. This is why the Nets are at 500. 40 seconds to go in overtime. Double stagger away. Joe Harris comes up. Two guys go. Allen with the finish. Misses the free throw here with the offensive rebound. Spencer Dinwiddie back with the ball. We saw the first clip where he knocks down the three. So now you have to stay close so he doesn't pull up on you. What does he do? Smart play. Gets downhill. A little bit of slide step around P.J. Tucker, bump and the foul, goes to the free throw line, puts the Nets up one, they secure the game. And so Spencer Dinwiddie, one of the great stories in the NBA, a player that has come back from injury, being traded, etc. Kenny Atkinson showing the confidence in him, and uh, the Nets with a big, big road win down in Houston. Fish, the Nets at 500 through 46 games for the first time since the 2012-2013 season. The Nets, they are coming. Derek Fisher in our film room. We're coming back with more live crunch time.